we're going to continue our psalm study. Um, I hope you're not getting tired of it. I, I'm enjoying it very much because I've never read through all the psalms before, and uh, and I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. This one, Psalm 16. Before we read it, as soon as I started reading it, I had to go study. It's called a miktam of David. M I C H T A M, and I had to, had to Google it to see how you pronounce that. And uh, there's a couple different uh, opinions about what that actually means. It's not a word that's commonly used in the Hebrew. It can be used as a, a, a metaphor or a description of gold and riches. So it could be something that's of great value. It could also be something uh, that means a covering up or a secret thing. And I... I I tend to lean toward the valuable opinion more than a secret thing because God's not secretive. He doesn't, he wouldn't write a psalm that is, uh, should be kept a secret in any way. And so I, I, I'm on the opinion that this is a valuable something of David. And some of the titles on some of the versions that I read title Psalm 16 as David's life commitment to God. And I want you to think about that for a second before we read it. Everyone here has made a life commitment to God. We've, we've given our lives to Him. We've been baptized, repented of our sins, and we've turned away from an old life and become a new creature and live in Him, uh, uh, observing all of His ordinances and trying to follow all of His commandments and living for Him to live as Christ, to die as gain. Do you or if, have you ever um, seen someone who may, may have had a, a deathbed confession or an end of their life change and belief in Jesus and ever think, even for a second, how unfair that is? That you've lived a life of obedience to Jesus and followed every ordinance, but then this person lived however they wanted to live and probably did some really bad things and caused some pain and at the end of their life they find salvation. Is that fair? If you've ever thought that, this is, this is a good song for you and me. Here's what it says. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the very beginning, David does something um, that's unique to some of the Psalms. He uses three different descriptive ways of talking about and to God the Father and the Creator. He says, O oh God, first, which is universal, O oh God, the Creator. And then on the second line, he says, O oh my soul, you have said to the Lord, talking about his soul, talking to the Lord. And you'll notice probably in most of your versions, uh, your translations, I have a New King James, 
and Lord is capitalized, L-O-R-D. That is a way for the translators to point us back to the Hebrew Yahweh. Yahweh being the name of God, which they don't actually use for its holy sake. They don't really use it. They use L-O-R-D or Lord. And then, again, you are my Lord. But this one's not capitalized. That is the word Adonai. And Adonai is another name for God. So you've got three there. You've got God the Creator, um, Elohim, which means Yahweh, and then Adonai. What David is doing in writing this this way is he's covering all of his bases. In the very beginning, he's letting everyone who's going to read this or hear this know who it is that he puts his trust in. He is not going to leave that question. It is not any other God, any idol, any universal um, any other deity but Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, the God of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and his fathers and his fathers and his fathers. He didn't leave that for question. He says, you are my Lord, my soul. You have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. David was a poet and he was able to really put out what he was feeling on the inside, which is something that a lot of us struggle with. It's hard to put into words how you really feel, especially when you're grieved, especially when you're worried. It's really hard to say what you feel without offending other people. For some, somehow, when I'm grieved or I'm worried about something, that takes, sometimes takes away from, some people may think that my faith is lacking, or some may, people may think, well, don't you trust me? I'll help you get through it. But if I'm pouring my heart out, that's just the way I feel. So we can't always control the way we feel. And it's okay to have feelings. Feelings that have nothing really to do with faith. We learn that from David. David is constantly pouring out his heart and telling God that he feels abandoned or forsaken or troubled. But that's not to take away from the faith that he has. It's just to say he's feeling that, although he is faithful. He says right here, I will put my trust in the Lord. But then he goes on, he says, my goodness is nothing apart from you. He realizes that there is nothing that he can do to please God, that any goodness that he might have only comes from God. There's only one way to have any kind of goodness, and that's from him. We know that. We've been taught that. Uh, my righteousness is as filthy rags. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We all know that. But yet we don't really live that way. See, we live as when we make a life commitment to God and to Jesus, we live in a way that says, I'm, I'm not better than anybody who's not saved, but I'm more enlightened. I'm saved and you're not. How blessed I am and how pitiful you are. Oh, I wish you could come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that I have. And for those that are legalistic and believe that they have some kind of inside knowledge or a, or a better understanding of, of a scripture than anybody else has, like everybody else, everybody believes that, but they got that one part wrong, that one part. And I can point to two or three different denominations that believe that that one part is the most important part. I'm not talking about the same part. Oh, they have different parts. Everybody from, from what day you should go or when you should be baptized or do you get baptized or do you take communion and is the communion does it truly become the blood of Christ when it goes into your mouth that's the people that believe that people that handle snakes and that's a thing we get caught up in how I'm doing it and if I'm doing it this way and I interpret it this way you have to be wrong because I'm right and it ends up becoming the exact same thing that happens in this world with most things. It's not necessarily about the point of the matter. It's about me being right. It's about me winning that argument and proving that I'm right about something. If I'm, if I'm right about something that you are deathly wrong about and, and it saves your soul, then that's fantastic. But if I'm right about something that doesn't matter and I fight you tooth and nail until you turn away from the faith, 
You turn away because I left a bad taste in your mouth because I tried to drill this one thing into you and you just give it up. I became a stumbling block and even worse, a jackhammer that pushed you away from Jesus. And what did that, what did it do? It did nothing. How would you feel if someone told you the reason they don't come to this church is you? What if nobody told you? What if there are people that are out there that won't come to the church just because of an experience they had with you? It's not Jesus they're not trusting in, but they're not trusting in Jesus because they know you. And if you trust in Jesus, it's not for me because I'm not with that person. That thing that we have, that, mm -mm, nope, I'm not going to go anywhere he goes, she goes. I wouldn't want to be that stumbling block to anybody. So back to my, my first question. If you make a life commitment to God and you spend 50 or 60 or 70 years in his service and someone at the end of their life in the last two years or two hours are saved, how is that fair? The truth is David knows. David's telling us right here that you and I are better for it, for having given our life over to Jesus, that we are actually the blessed ones, not the person that was able to do all the wretched things that this world says is okay to do, not, not the person who was able to live in sin all their life. Because for most people coming to, well, two things. First, there are a lot of people that come to Jesus or believe they have because they've said a prayer in a moment of, of weakness or some, some preacher or, or revival or uh, some emotion that they had. They had some kind of emotional response to, to a, at a concert or a thing, and they believe that they've given their life to Jesus, and they walk away the same person, but they have Jesus in the back of their pocket, and maybe they even attend church a little bit, but they never truly change because nobody ever really emphasizes the change. That it's not, it's not a magical lightning bolt. It's not, um, some people have, a, some people might have a, a true uh, Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus conversion, you know, wham, happened, you know, where they see the light and bammo, and that's awesome. Mine wasn't like that, and I'm not just going off my experience. I've heard a lot of other people say that, too. It's a gradual thing. It's something that you get pulled. You definitely feel the Holy Spirit pull you. You definitely feel that, and you get pulled toward it, but like we've talked about recently in a couple other messages, it's not about what it does for me, but who I become because of him. And that's, that's the part that a lot of people don't realize. It's, it's not something that you do for what you get out of it. That's why as soon as you become saved, everybody tries to put you to work. It's because it's not about what it did for you. It's about what he's going to do through you. Now you, you've got a purpose now. You've been saved now. And now that you're in this family, you got to pull your weight. And you've got to learn. And it's a progressive, it's a progressive thing. So David talks about, um, in verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And then he says in verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Sheol being the grave or the depths. Not just death, not just um, down, but separate, separated from God and completely in darkness and utter, just gone, you know, that he will not leave us out there. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. David, writes here about where true contentment can be found. Because here's, here's the, the picture that I, I want to lay out. If a person comes to the, the true saving grace, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at the end of their life, whether it's two years, two days, two hours, if it's, if it's true, if it's not just a, oh no, I'm about to die, I better say a prayer, right? Say that prayer for me, do the thing. You know, do the thing. No, if it's a true repentance for how you how you lived and you came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, then that's fantastic. 
we get bitter because here we are, the saints, struggling through life, not getting to enjoy life the way that the sinner does. But does the sinner really enjoy life? See, that's the question. True contentment is only found in Jesus and only found in, I, I go to sleep at night not thinking about what happens when I die. I'm not worried about that anymore. I'm not, I'm worried more about my children and, and paying the mortgage and, you know, stuff like that. But the one thing that I don't have to consider ever is what happens. Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. When I don't want to go because I want to spend time with my children. I'd love to see my grandchildren or even great-grandchildren. That would be awesome. But if, if whatever God's will is for my life, that's, that's what it's going to be. So I try to do the best that I can. Hopefully, I get that far. And I at least get to see them all grow up and out of the house. Because I would never want to leave them without a father. At least for a certain time. You know, there'd, be, there'd at least be some time between my death and when my wife remarries, I hope. <laughs> so, I mean, not too much time, but give me some. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's what the worry, that's what the worry is, not where I'm going. People in the world, one, they act like they don't care. They act like they don't care where they're going. The, the, the truth is they put blinders on to the fact that they're going somewhere, but every single one of them is worried. If they weren't, there wouldn't be so many paranormal um, movies and ghost stories and all these other things. There's all these other things that take attention off what happens when you die? Oh, there's this, and there's that, and there's this. No. And then I'm talking to the dead, and no, you're not. No, you're not. David knows, and we should know, that true contentment and rest, he says, my flesh also will rest in hope. I can sleep. I can stop. I can not worry about it. At least that. What is it Forrest Gump said? You know, one less thing. That's one less thing you ain't going to worry about. I ain't going to worry about how I'm going to die or when I'm going to die. I, I ain't worried about that. I know where I'm going to go after I die. And that is okay with me. The second thing that I just, I just want to bring out of this psalm is how he talks about he has set the Lord always before him. That that is the goal. That is the focus. When we pray... When we're thankful, we got Thanksgiving coming up pretty soon. We're going to talk about being thankful and we're going to say our prayers around the table about what we're thankful for. But here's something I'd like to put in your mind now that came out of this song. Are you thankful for the blessings or the blessor? Thankful for the one that's giving us what he's given us. Every minute, every day, every year of our lives has a gift. And then everything that he's given us, all the, the homes, the property, the, the vacation days, the whatever, it's all a blessing. And yes, we should be thankful for those things, but we can't remember who it was that granted them to us. And that's what David talks about here when he talks about um, idols, when he says, their sorrows shall be multiplied in verse 4, who hasten after another god, their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor take up their names on my lips. O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. At verse 5, he's quoting, uh, he's quoting from Numbers or Deuteronomy, one of the two, um, something that Moses, that, he, that God told to Moses, that I will be your inheritance and your portion. David knows that he's going to get an inheritance in the next life that has nothing to do with this life. And here's, here's what's funny about that. David is in a period of time in our Bible history, where they don't have the resurrection. They don't have that to go off of, yet that's what he's talking about here. That's exactly the kind of peace that he has, that wherever it is that I'm going, whatever it is that's going to happen, because he hasn't been given the good news. That hasn't happened yet, you know. So wherever it is that I'm going, it's going to be with you. You will not leave me in the grave. You will give me an inheritance. I have something, a portion that you've promised my father's father's father, and if you promised it to them, you promised it to me. We have the good news. We have the gospel. We, we have an even greater reason to put our faith in the hope of that inheritance, of that um, next life. And that's, that's kind of who David is talking about 
in uh, verse 10 when he says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. If you notice, your Holy One is capitalized. Because most scholars believe that that is a prophetic statement. Because who is the Holy One? David's not the Holy One. It's Jesus. It's a foreshadowing of, of Jesus Christ to come. And then he tells us at the end, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of the Father. <clears throat> he is where we are ultimately going to go. He is where, where he told Thomas, uh, where I go, you know. And then Thomas said, no, we don't know where you're going. And he says, if you know the Father, you know me. And you know where I'm going. I am the way the truth, and the life. That is the hope that we have, and that is the hope that we need to, to share with other people, in, in not just the way we say it, or when we say it, but how we live, and hopefully we won't be a stumbling block to anyone, so that they don't live in a state of perpetual worry, and bitterness, and uh, in sin. Because the, the thing is, he says here too, in verse 3, as for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. That's what David's soul is saying to God. So for the, the people who give a life commitment to God, God delights in that. He's looking at us. Now, he's not pleased. I mean, we're not going to make him happy. We, we can't. We're, our righteousness is his filthy rags. We're never going to be good enough. But he delights in our effort. He delights in knowing that we're part of his family. He delights in our worship, in our song, and he, he delights in when we try to do his will, when we share the good news with someone, and if it brings someone in to the faith. And what we got to do a lot of times is put ourselves aside and get people to come through the doors, get people to come in, not be a, not, not be a stumbling block or a place that they see as, as a family. It is a family church. But not, no, I can't go there because those families go there, or and I deal with these people, or oh, they got that that weirdo preacher, or you know, we don't, we need to try to be a place that's open to anyone to come in. Why we try to do that? But we have to invite them too, and then we live in a way that I'm not beating you to death with the gospel, but I am going to tell you about it, and I am going to say, well, all right, God bless you, or uh, thanks be to God for everything He's given me, you know. Thank Jesus that he gave, gave me that church. You ever come to church down at Tilden? Man, you'd love it there. I mean, it's just a good place. Little stuff like that. We plant those little seeds, you know, and that's, that's what we're supposed to do. So it's, it's funny that we'll end with the first verse. In the very first verse, it's, it's David telling us that it's in God that he will put his trust in everything. And we know David's life. David's life was up, down, up, down. So when he writes stuff like this, he never swayed, he never steered away from putting his trust in God. Even when he failed at his worst, when he was called on it, he dropped to his knees. He said, you're right, you're right. He never turned away from God and said, just forget it then, forget it. I'll just, I'll just you know, worship these pagan gods because they say what I did was okay. He never did. He always put his trust in God. And it's like we were talking about just earlier. God's in control of everything. Everything that's going on, everything that's going to happen, it may not go the way we want it to. God's in control of it. He may not steer us down the path that we want to go down. God's in control of it, especially if you let him be, especially if you just, if you give, give up and submit. That's where true contentment comes from is I don't know what you're doing right now, but whatever it is, I trust you. Like, like Paul and, and Peter would have said, you know, I don't want to die this way. But if this is what you want to have happen, okay. Like the martyrs in the in the two hundreds and the three hundreds that built our that built the everything that we stand on. I'm sure they didn't want to die the way that they did, or live in secrecy the way that a lot of them had to to carry on the church. But they did because that's that's the portion that God gave them. But they had an inheritance, and they put their hope and faith in that. And so so should we. If you would go with me to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for being our blesser. We thank you for the blessings that you give us, but more so we, 
We want you to know that we put you first. We continually seek you and we put our trust in you. Whatever it is that you're going to do in our lives individually, in this church collectively, in our nation, and ultimately in the world, we pray that above all else, your will is done over ours. We may not understand it. Many times we may not even agree with it. But we want you to know that we understand you are in control of everything. And we allow ourselves to submit to you in it. Whatever it is you have for us to do, whatever purpose it is, we'll do it gladly. We pray for those who are mentioned here tonight who are sick, those that are battling the coronavirus, those that uh, have been seriously affected by it. We pray that um, that you will be, your will be done in all of it. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank <laughs> you.